it was the beginning of really understanding in order to represent our clients, we first really had to understand ourselves and our response to these crimes and how we worked our way through our own grief. Um, because one of the things I learned that if I stood in the courtroom next to Rick with the initial feelings I had about the crime and about what he had done, then I would get him killed. Over a million Americans face sentencing every year, and it will be the most important day of their lives. But we don't fully understand the system, how broken it is, and what we can do to make it better. I'm Doug Passan. I'm a 25-year criminal defense lawyer and a sentencing expert. My goal is to bring more awareness, more fairness, and more humanity to the sentencing process. So, are you ready? Then let's get set for sentencing. Hey everybody, Doug Passan coming to you from Studio 3553 in Scottsdale, Arizona. Helping us get set for sentencing today. An extraordinary attorney, uh, mitigation specialist, consultant, you name it, by the name of Cindy Short. She's been working in capital cases for, oh, 29 years or more. And uh, one of her, I think, um, most impressive qualifications is that in that 29 years, she has never had a death verdict. So she's doing something right, and that's what we're going to talk about today. And I think what you're going to find is it's a lot of outside-the-box lawyering, a lot of reliance on people from different disciplines, different fields to give us a different perspective, and most importantly, a whole lot of really, really powerful narrative. Good stories win cases. And so that's what we're going to talk about today with Cindy Short. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I so appreciate it. How are you? Oh, good, good. Thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. Good. All right. So um, you're a Kansas City in Kansas City, Missouri, right? Yes, I yep. am. Cindy teaches at the law school there and um, is also on the um, faculty of Jerry Spence Trial Lawyers College. Been there since 1994 and runs the death penalty program there. So this is a person who is deeply, deeply, deeply rooted in the experience of capital litigation in our country and has an amazing perspective to offer. Uh, she sent me some materials to prepare for this, and it was in the form of two article. So I, I think that's what we're going to use to sort of guide our conversation today. Um, the first one, you said it was a pivotal case that came 20 plus years ago when you were assigned to the case of a gentleman by the name of Richard DeLong. So yeah. tell me about Mr. DeLong. What was the case and how did you come to be involved? Well, at the time I was a public defender. I was in the capital division of the Missouri Public Defender's Office. Um, and I had come out of the trial division, um, but I'll tell you, I had taken a little hiatus from the public defender's office because uh, over the previous few years, I had really worn myself out um, because of the way I, I approached uh, cases. And frankly, when I was a young attorney, we tried a lot of cases. Um, and so I went for a short period of time to a plaintiff's law firm and then I had the opportunity to go to uh, Jerry Spence's Trial Lawyers College in the very first class that was offered. Um, and it was during that 30 days in Du Bois, Wyoming, that I really decided that my heart was truly in indigent defense. Um, and I made the really life altering decision to return to the public defender's office and do capital work. And it was really Rick DeLong's case, um, which involves a very horrific crime that changed my entire perspective on how to approach uh, capital work. Um, I think we can be really, really wonderful, talented, successful criminal defense attorneys, but the same um, qualities that make us really great criminal defense attorneys can in fact lead to um, poor representation of capital clients. And I learned that in the DeLong case. Um, 
this case really challenged me because Mr. DeLong and his co-defendants were charged with the murders of a mother who was nine months pregnant. Uh, she was on the verge of giving birth to her eighth child um, and was living with three of her other children who ranged in age from 10 down to seven. And uh, Rick was accused of killing um, each of those children in um, a very, you know, terrible hands-on kind of way through strangulation. And it was really the first time as a public defender that I questioned whether or not I could represent someone who had done something so horrendous, so horrific. And so it was the beginning of really understanding in order to represent our clients, we first really had to understand ourselves and our response to these crimes and how we worked our way through our own grief um, because one of the things I learned that if I stood in the courtroom next to Rick with the initial feelings I had about the crime and about what he had done, then I would get him killed. Hmm. Uh, and that was a really great lesson. And I started to spend my energy in a different way in that representation, getting myself out into the public, uh, getting myself into spaces so I could talk about the case and really start to overcome my own um, um, prejudices about him and, and um, the situation. I had to learn how to uh, overcome those things in order to be the best advocate to tell his story. So let me stop you here. This is there's so there's so much good stuff to un unpack, though. Um, but this is this is fundamentally a conflict that I see occurring because I work with lawyers all over the country as as you do. And this idea of otherization in the sense that your client doesn't look like us often, doesn't have the same background. It's very, very hard to connect. Right. And if a lawyer can't connect with a client, how are they going to expect uh, you know, the decision makers to connect. So it sounds like in, in a very real way, you're putting a premium on your ability to find some connective material in, in, in your client, no matter how awful the crime is. And here's what Cindy, how I knew we were kindred spirits. So you wrote this incredible article. It's from back in 2004 publication called the warrior, uh, with your permission, I'll put a link to it in the show notes so people can see this. Um, yeah. And uh, it's that there's a there's a part at the end of page one that said, "Oh, yeah, the, the, this is my this is my person." So you, you say, "I'm going to quote." In my opinion, we are doing what is not taught in law schools or at many death penalty seminars, and even frowned upon by lawyers who believe in emotional distance from their client and his or her story. The successful death penalty lawyers and their teams are forming bonds with our clients, walking in their shoes, seeing the world through their eyes and bringing these experiences to life in the courtroom. This is everything I ever teach people on cases I work with and times I teach in all my writings. This is this is so fundamentally at the heart of what we do. And I want people to understand because a lot of people are going to be, oh, that's not for me. You know, this is just a cold clinical endeavor. N no, we're going to have that discussion. We're going to have that debate. But I think to just preface this, because maybe some people are listening going, well, I don't do capital work. So this is interesting, but I'm going to turn off now. And and the, the truth is, um, we are learning so much in the non-capital world from the way that capital, good capital teams approach mitigation. And a lot of that is they're on the forefront. And it's been seeping into the way that non-capital lawyers do their jobs. So the point is you need to keep listening because even if you've never in your life will ever do a capital case, we have so much to learn from those who do, right? I, yeah, I, I you know, yeah. I, being a capital lawyer has done so much to teach me how to represent clients generally, whether it's a civil case, whether it is a a, a car theft case, a city case, it doesn't matter. Um, but connection with client is critical. And frankly, it is what keeps me in it. <laughs> yeah, is the best part about it. Mm hmm. 
it's the hardest part about it sometimes too to let break down those walls and feel something yeah. especially when the result isn't what you want but apparently you never have that problem because you win all your cases yeah. but yeah. um but yeah so and and i want to ask you this question too before we move forward and i sometimes ask people this especially when it comes up in the context of a really horrific crime a lot of people who don't understand what we do just say Ugh. How do you represent those people? You've heard it a million times. Every lawyer's got their own sort of reflexive response. What's yours? Um, you know, I what I have found is that there is um, something in every human being I've ever met that is uh, redeeming, redemptive. Um, so often the people that we come into contact with have suffered traumas that are um, larger than we can imagine. I think that um, I have found and been blessed with um, the ability, which I do not know where it comes from, to be able to walk in open and without judgment and the ability to simply listen. And I think that in our culture, in our society, that we do not listen to people enough and if we listened earlier and longer and more often to people, you and I would not meet them. Um, but we do. And I think one of the great gifts that I can give, even to the, the clients that go to prison for long periods of time, as many as, of my clients do, is the ability to um, help them understand what's happened to them in their lives. And then um, hopefully to help other people who are going to make decisions about their lives understand how they got to where they are and to be more compassionate about how we're going to respond to the mm. terrible things that have happened. And that's a new concept in a lot of ways or a concept people don't really think about that part of our jobs is to help our clients understand themselves. Yes, yes. Yeah. We're making a lot of times making sense out of something that seems very senseless in terms yeah. of the hor horrific. And and we start with the client. How do you arrive at this moment? So, well, let's get back to Mr. DeLong. You, you said, you know, really in this amazing article that you wrote that this case became sort of the foundation for your philosophy mm -hmm. and your approach to representing your clients in whatever capacity you're doing it. So so tell me what what happened there and, and, and what did you do and how did it change the way you practice? I think one of the things that it really taught me about is collaboration. I think that um, when you are allowed to have the opportunity to that, we all need teams. We need people to help us understand stories. And sometimes that person that can help you to understand the story may have the title of paralegal. Uh, they may have the title of investigator. They may be the associate counsel. They may be an intern. Um, but when you're a public defender, you need to draw on as many uh, team members as you can and and really learn from from people. You know, I learned early on that that lots of my clients, as you said earlier, have had experiences in their life with which I have no personal experience. And so I had to find ways to understand those things, whether it was addiction, whether it was domestic violence, whether it was child abuse. And so I wanted to find ways to use my energy in the representation to have a deeper understanding of those um, um, experiences. And so sometimes that is about getting in the field and, and seeing where a person lives or sitting in their church home or um, sitting with their parents for long periods of time um, to try to understand not only where the client came from, but what was the experience of the parent that caused them to parent the way that they did. Um, if I want to understand addiction, I want to be sitting with addicts and listening to the way they talk about their addiction. If I want to understand homelessness, I want to be out in the world seeing people in um in that state of homelessness. And so I spent time in one case for a period of three months where I was out feeding the homeless because it was an integral part of my case. And when the witnesses took the witness stand, the benefit is that the witnesses understood that I understood. When an addict takes a stand, the stand and I'm talking to them about addiction, 
they understand that I understand because of the language that I'm using, because of the empathy that I can bring to the table, because I've spent the time um, in the field. If I wanna understand what a medical examiner does, I wanna be in the room where he does the autopsy. You know, So I really started to choose the way in which I used my time differently. I wanted to be up out uh, from behind my desk and really being uh, much, much more experiential about the way I explored the case, the client's experience. Um, and of course, it goes without saying, hours and hours and hours sitting across the table from the actual client. Mm -hmm. Yep, 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 yep. That's the only way you build up those bonds of trust with the client is by sitting in the room with them. And even though you have this great team in place, I think a lot of lawyers think that's their sort of um, escape hatch that, okay, I've got this great team so they can do that legwork and I can stay in the office. Uh, it doesn't work like that, though, does it? No, it does not. No. And I think, you know, one of the things that Jerry Spence's trial lawyers college did for me is it really gave me permission to, um, you know, I'm always afraid to say this, but I say it very often in front of groups of lawyers, is it really gave me permission to say goodbye to the law <laughs> in the sense that the law wasn't doing my clients any good. Yeah. What does my clients good is story. My understanding and connecting with the client and being able to come into the courtroom and truly put their face on. I often tell my clients that the prosecutor is going to fictionalize you. You will not recognize the person that they're talking about. And so my job is to bring you back into the courtroom. The law can't do that for you. Your story can do that for you. Um, and my understanding your story can do that for you. And, and, and frankly, even when my clients go away to prison, they are satisfied when they are, they can see themselves described in the courtroom. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I lost my track there. Um, and so with the law, now I have to have a member of my team that where I say to the team, I want to do X, find the way in the law. Right. But I will not be burdened with the right. law because, right. you know, Doug, it gets in our way. Yeah. Um, I have very often been in the courtroom and lawyers will come up to me afterwards and say, well, how did you do that? There's a rule against that. <laughs> I didn't know about the rule. Uh -huh. <laughs> the prosecutor didn't care and the judge didn't care. So we cannot be allow our stories to be diminished by rules that are not. In I love that. I love that. File that under. It's better to ask forgiveness than permission, right? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Well, yeah. you know, I agree a thousand percent in terms of the law not helping. And, I, you know, it's amazing to me just as far as simple sentencing memos go, how often a lawyer will spend three, four, five, six pages, the first of precious time, little time and little space for your audience wasted on the law when A, it doesn't really matter that much and b the judge knows it anyway it's all boilerplate right. get to the story yes. um and so what is i i do want to get back to mr delong's case but just while we're on the subject of story um because you know that it's everything in a case i'm just wondering like how do you become a student of story where do you get your how do you build your story muscles um you know it's storytelling is not intuitive. It's not easy. Um, it, re and it really does require a lot of effort to learn about it and put it into practice. So what was your story journey? Well, you know, my story journey, I, you know, when I came out of law school, you would not have um, paid me enough money to stand in front of a group and give a speech. I had no desire to be a trial attorney. I had, this was not my path. And so my uh, very first appointment out of federal court in St. Louis was to, believe it or not, represent an individual named Tammy Williams, who was being accused along with her husband of attempting to assassinate Jesse Jackson, who was at the time running for president. So just a little teeny tiny case you got, you yes. found yourself involved in. Less than six months out of law school, had never been in a courtroom, had never been to a jail, and yet they were appointing me, which was my first clue that the system might not be working the way it should. 
<laughs> um, but it took me to a play. I was very fortunate to um, partner with a lawyer in St. Louis who was very generous with his time. And I went from a situation where I saw the law as being very dead and uninteresting in the job I was in to the possibility of really making a difference in the lives of, of people. And I left that experience and immediately started applying to the public defender's office and the uh, prosecutor's office. And fortunately, I got a job with the public defenders because that's truly where my heart was. So in order to get on this storytelling journey, I started with Toastmasters, mm. you know, lunchtime. Um, and, um, and then I would say that over the next few years, trying cases, you know, you are, it's trial and error. You're doing what you think is, you know, what your other um, people in the courthouse is what you're seeing. But then it's really trial lawyers college was in 94 is what really made the difference for me. And they use a method called psychodrama mm -hmm. where you are asked to really truly get into the shoes of your client, um, to tell stories in the first person, to um, really take on the voice of the client. Um, and, and so I did that for the 30 days, and then I returned every year for the next 22 years. And so I really invested very heavily in uh, honing uh, those skills, both in the spoken word as well as in the written word. Nice, nice. Uh, yeah, I wanted to talk about, I'm glad you brought up psychodrama because we'll get there too. I have a podcast episode on that. And I work with a fantastic lawyer out of Detroit, the Detroit area, Patrick Barone, who's a who's a graduate of the trial college there and was so enamored with psychodrama that he went on to get a thousand hour certification. So he's a certified psychodramatist and has the Michigan Psychodrama Center. And and wow. I've been and I really didn't know from psychodrama until I met Patrick and he's been helping me integrate that into my cases as well. Um, mm -hmm. Just just especially in terms of helping the client come to terms with the under, their own understanding, like we talked about, that's a really powerful tool. Do you do you use that in your cases as well? I do. You know, I don't the lawyers from TLC use it in all different types of ways. But even what I talked about earlier, you know, getting in the field and um, and spending time with the homeless, I think that's a form of psychodrama. Um, I think, you know, when you're in a jail setting with the clients and you're asking them to reenact something that's happened in their lives, you have a much smaller space and you have to be careful about leaving them in a, in a particular emotional space. Yeah. I have done that. I've done some psychodrama in the courtroom to help the court um, see or understand um, a setting in which the client who's psychotic is being interrogated by um, not only a sheriff's deputy, but also a deacon from his church at the same time. Um, and what I have found when it's used in the courtroom, you know, judges are, I think, just, just demonstratively bored by us. And so when you choose to do something that's a little different, um, you see them lean forward, you see, see them help you make a record. Um, they are, um, intrigued and um and interested and and i've never seen in my experience i know other people have been shut down in various ways but in my experience i have found judges to be um open you know to more action um yeah more storytelling than than less absolutely okay so let's get back to um mr delong so keep going with this so he's He's accused of a horrible crime. I don't think guilt. I don't think this was an innocence case. There was really no, no, not a big uh, dispute about his role in in these crimes. So, so how? What's what's the defense look like? What are, what are you focused on? Well, so one of the, I guess, one of the big epiphanies in this case was that the crime was so horrific, and this really was about penalty, and there really wasn't any question we were going to get to trial. And so I remember sitting around with my team, and we said, you know, look, we are just going to have to go out there and find the truth. 
And when we find the truth, we're going to then have to understand it. We're going to have to then present it. Um, because what was very clear to me is that we were going to have to be in trial for a long time. <laughs> Uh, in order to help the jurors. It was the first time that I really recognized it in a death penalty case, and I think this is true in murder cases, I think this is true in serious child sex abuse cases, that there is, um, that we are ourselves as attorneys, and I think that our jurors are going through the stages of grief. And in a trial, in a capital trial, we have to give jurors time to absorb the, the horror of the crime that's been committed and is being presented to them that we've really had several years to take in and, and evaluate and analyze and think about. And they're going to have to take it in in a very short amount of time. Mm -hmm. And so we have to, and you know, my, my, my thinking in trial is everything I'm doing I'm doing for you, Mr. Juror and Miss Juror. And so um, when I make choices to make presentation of mitigation evidence, I'm doing this to help you make the most important decisions that you will ever have to make and that you will have to live with. And so I'm here to help you do that. And the first thing I need to do is to help you get through these stages of grief because I do not want you to have to make this decision while you're in the stage of anger. And one of the things we all know about um, grieving is it takes time. Yeah. Uh, and so through working on Rick's case, we had to recognize our own grieving for this family. We chose in this particular instance to take on the family. That is, we were not going to file motions to excise this family from the trial we were going to embrace and understand the experience of this family so we could be empathetic about them. Mm -hmm. This baby that was killed uh, was Rick's child. Uh, Rick had spent a considerable amount of time in this home with these children. Um, so we had to embrace that family. Yeah. Also knew from reporting in the paper, and this was another important lesson for us, is we really needed to watch what the community was learning and saying about Rick and the investigative reporting. And although Rick had a criminal history and although Rick had done this horrific thing, a lot of the reporting was reporting about a good guy. This, so this inconsistent picture, um, huh. which really helped us to start to formulate a plan in terms of getting out to the community and also our use of the media to tell you the truth. Yes, in our that. first um, court appearance, I felt that it was vital. It, this is, again, this is non- Anti-lawyering. Anti-lawyering, a non-criminal <laughs> defense lawyer, that we needed to apologize. And we needed to do it publicly. Yeah. And I wanted that in the newspaper because I wanted the witnesses that I needed to get to to know that he had taken responsibility so that when I knocked on their door, they would answer the door. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Um, so, yeah. So let's just wrap our heads around this because this is early on in the case. Do you remember what kind of hearing, what kind of proceeding it was when he does this? It was really there. It was like a status hearing, to tell you the truth. It, there yeah. was no um, substantive motion. And it was at the very end of the hearing, Doug. And I said to the court, there was one more thing that I would like to do. Judge. <laughs> we would like to apologize. <laughs> and the judge, to his credit, um, you know, really... I, and, you know, the other thing about doing that was I was always thinking about the impact of what we were doing on the judge, because the judge would be making decisions, obviously, along the way. And I needed to be um, I needed him to understand we were taking responsibility. I needed him to know that Rick was not a monster. Um, and so um, the judge allowed us to make the statement. And then the. You know, the, the whole room was full of press, both uh, TV press and, and print press. And so we had copies of the apology ready to pass out to them. And um, and 
and that was the meat and potatoes of that hearing for me. <laughs> Which is amazing. And again, it's 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 antithetical to everything we're taught as lawyers. This is so early. Don't say anything. Certainly not to when there's press involved certainly not an open court when they're making a record of it shut up that's our best advice to a client and sometimes we have to get out of our own way and realize the big picture what's yes. what's what's the long game and the yeah. long game is he's not winning at trial his admissions can't hurt him no um any more than he's already hurt that's right. um they can only help save help save him and that so that's eyes on the prize when we talk about the and when you talked about the five stage of grief that was another super novel concept to me in terms of its application in the setting of what we do um denial anger bargaining depression and finally acceptance and how much time that takes to go through. And I think anyone just reflexively listening to this podcast now who hears you talk about what Mr. DeLong was accused of what he did is just going to be stewing in the anger stage, especially right. someone who's not a lawyer who's used to who is used to these horrible stories. So right now, I want anybody who's listening to this to sort of just take a second and feel that and how angry you are and that the goal that we're trying to do is to move you through the through that and on to what's what's next. So how are you going to do it? Yeah. How are you going to do it? Yeah, you know, so one of the other big lessons in DeLong um, was, so so the story um, really at its heart was about a man, Rick, who loved a woman named Stacy, who was dying of HIV AIDS. Erin, the victim, loved Rick, and um, she was, in his view, in, interfering in his relationship with Stacy, which was hastening Stacy's death. And this was the motive for Rick's ultimate horrific crime. So while we were waiting for trial, Stacy died uh, in custody. And um, I made a motion that Rick should be allowed to go to her funeral. Now I knew there wasn't a hope in Hades that she would get to go or that he would get to go to her funeral, but it was an important motion from a client standpoint. And so we go to court and the judge showed his compassion. He says, and again, the room is full of, of reporters and the judge says to Rick, you know, Mr. DeLong, I'm sorry, I cannot grant this motion, but I cannot guarantee your safety. And so um, we cannot do this. And then I'm thinking, well, she's being cremated. That means she's mobile. So we could bring her to the jail. <laughs> and Rick had a minister that was visiting him who he would, had formed a really close relationship with. So I stood up and I said, I would like to modify this motion and request that Rick, um, that we be allowed to have the service, a private service at the jail, bring the ashes to the jail. And you would have thought that I had, I don't know, committed the largest sin on the face of the earth by the reaction of the prosecutor mm -hmm. who literally popped out of his chair and he was stuttering. And he said, oh, you know, you know they're going to try to smuggle something in. And the I mean, he didn't know what to say. And to the judge's credit, he said to the sheriff, he turns to the sheriff and he says, make that happen. Mm -hmm. And so as I'm leaving the courtroom, one of the reporters who I'd been talking to says to me, you know, gosh, Miss Short, my readers will not understand how your client is capable of love or loving anyone given what he has done. And when I walked away from her, I thought, what a gift she has given me. I will need to prove throughout this case that Rick is loved and Rick is capable of love. And I will need to do that in an overt way, not a covert way. And so we began to uh, think about that in all the different witnesses that we talked about and how we would bring love into the courtroom, even in the midst of something that was so horrific. 
And how do you build that motif into the, I mean, obviously the most horrible aspect of the case is the children. And, and so the story about the love of the ex-girlfriend and the girlfriend makes a lot of sense, but how do you translate that over into why this had to happen with the kids? Yeah. So, you know, part of it was that, um, you know, there's a lot of layers to this. And um, mm -hmm. one of the images that were used was if you think about a pebble when you drop it in the water and you get all the concentric circles. And so my imagery was that the where you drop the pebble in was the homicide. And then we had to explain all of the circles all the way out to biology, frankly. And the circle, the very closest in was this love triangle. Um, and and so one of the things that we had was that Rick had children from another marriage. Um, he had a relationship with the three children that were killed that was remarkably loving. And this, this household in which they had been raised was remarkably neglectful. Um, and so we were able to tell some aspects of, of that story. I don't think that won the day by any stretch of the imagination, but his relationship with his own children was important, I think, and critical, frankly. Um, he was also high on um, methamphetamine at the time, but more importantly, he was taking a experimental drug called Sestiva. And the combination of those things um, contributed to a kind of a psychotic uh, break, which we were able to uh, provide testimony about to the jury. Um, but I think that the moment that we really were able to see the love that um, he could express and was expressed towards him was through a minister, Reverend Houston, who had developed a relationship with him over two years that we watched from afar but when Reverend Houston took the witness stand and described his relationship and love for Rick, um, it was heart melting. Mm. And, um, you know, later when I was had an opportunity to talk to the jurors, um, they said to me, your client killed this family, but your client is not a killer. Mm. Doug, I never said that in the trial, but that was where I wanted them. I wanted to lead them. Mm -hmm. And so for these primarily women to say that to me later at a dinner, um, I don't think it's any one thing. I think it's six weeks worth of lots of different stories that are told through the very first witness that took the stand for the state and the very last witness that took the stand for me. That's the hardest part of storytelling, I think, is not to beat them over the head with a, a novice lawyer would have probably led with that as their theme. You know, my client had killed his family, but he's not a killer. Yeah. And 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 ref, um, the initial response, it's like trying to force someone to eat their vegetables when they don't like broccoli, like they're going to shut their mouth. They're not going to eat that. No. And you have to feed them gently the truth of the narrative and let them come to their own decisions like that. And that is not easy to do, but it's but if you construct the narrative the right way, it's hopefully the inevitable, the inevitable conclusion. Right. Right. Um, but again, so difficult to do. Um, and you've talked about there's this is another important piece of this with narrative and your job is to guide the jury and and to sort of so it reminds me my mentor in storytelling is Dr. Randy Olson and um and he always is fond of saying narrative is leadership mm -hmm. and that by telling this story you're actually assuming the leadership role that I'm going to help you understand this I'm going to help you make your own decision about what's right in this in this case Yes. Um, so lawyers as leaders in the courtroom are is is actually another sort of um, concept that's not instinctive. Uh, yeah. We're very respond. We're very reflexive sometimes. We're, we're re not reflexive, but just sort of um, reactive. Like we we're we're not proactive. We sort of you know, well, this is their case, so I'm going to poke a little hole in it here. I'm going to try to rub away in this side here, 
but you're not taking ownership of your own telling your own story and controlling your own narrative. So lawyer leadership narrative is a leadership. Okay. So um, these are good takeaways. Now you had um, mentioned in your article that Rick had a sister. What do you do about the sister? Because these are uh, in in my opinion, the relativity stories, which is comparing this to that, and the prosecutor's go to argument is always the same, right. which is so and so grew up in the same terrible house, and they didn't go out and kill anybody, right? Right. And so we oftentimes have to tell those stories along with it to say, well, maybe they have their own story of trauma and they dysfunction, or maybe they don't, and this is why. You know, yeah. but was that an issue in this case? Because I know there was a, at least one sibling involved. Yeah, he had a couple of sisters. And um, and I think, you know, one of the things I've learned over the years is that we can sometimes make a mistake that the siblings, for, for example, can tell our clients stories. Um, and I think in the households where our clients come from, everyone is trying to survive. And so I have over the years backed up and said, instead of having siblings try to tell you the client's story, tell me your story. And, and it, inevitably in that story, you find the client's story because they're raised very often by the same single mother or by the same parents or grandparents or whatever it is. And I think also, particularly with uh, brothers versus sisters, and we know the research shows that sisters often have much more resilience, many more mentors, uh, there are lots of reasons why the women don't end up in prison where the boys do. But but it is a um, mistake to think that because they didn't end up in prison, because they didn't hurt someone, that their lives are not full of dysfunction. And so um, very often with the siblings, what we're what we see is um, addiction. What we see is untreated depression. What we see is single parenthood. Um, what we see is them living in poverty. And so we then, as we did with these sisters, have to reframe. Um, and also we look at pecking order. Uh, we look at mentorship to see why there are differences. Did sister make it? to high school graduation? Um, did brother get put into the system to be fed into the prison system, which he was? Um, Rick and his group was really became um, a little gang of thieves for his stepfather, who I referred to as Fagan, you know, like, so he had all of these little Oliver Twist boys that were running out and stealing for him, that didn't apply to the sisters. So he was set up in a much different way than the sisters okay. were. But the sisters had their own traumas. And then, of course, the hard thing, Doug, is to, to get people to understand why their stories need to be made public when they haven't done anything wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, the, the other thing in a capital case that we're doing inevitably is we are prosecuting someone, whether we're prosecuting the system, the educational system, but many, many times we're prosecuting parents. Mm -hmm. And so to take a parent like Rick's mother, for example, and try to understand and have compassion for her story, but at the same time explain to her, we will be prosecuting you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we will be um, laying some of this blame at your feet. Um, but we also need to understand why your parenting went sideways. Um, and very often we know it's because she herself came into parenting traumatized. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, she, Rick was the product of rape. And right. um, so obviously his beginnings were um, from trauma. Yeah. And, and off we go to the races. Does Rick, I know he does an apology statement early on. What's what's his allocution or how is he conveying his remorse and in, in court in the penalty phase? So Rick did not. So once we got to um, once the jury had sentenced, he did not speak to the jury. You're, now you're testing my memory, but he <laughs> did not speak to the jury. I think he did speak to the judge. The judge was very, very um, proud of this verdict which was interesting. He was very proud of his jurors. He offered the jurors uh, counseling if they wanted it. I've never wow. had that happen before. 
um, he he would have voted for life is, you know, which is the remarkable thing. But a lot of that was the setup with story. I filed something with him called a notice of non-statutory mitigating factors, which was a document which was uh, part of my reputation. My name is Cindy Short, but in the courthouse, I'm often known as Cindy Long. And mm -hmm. um, this notice of non-statutory aggravating circumstances is not required. And it, let's say it was 60 pages. I don't remember what it was. It had not a piece of law in it, but it was Rick's mitigation story. And I filed it with the judge probably a month before trial so that he understood the mitigation story. And I was hoping that would help me with rulings that he made. And it did, but it also prejudiced him to my mitigation story um, because he is my 13th juror. No question about it. And so I need him to understand the story. And I really, when I'm working with lawyers now, I'm like begging them <laughs> to really consider the judge as someone they need to be telling this story to incrementally th from, the, from the time they get to the case to the time they resolve the case. That's a hard sell though, I found. Interesting, interesting, okay. Um, something else in the article is that um, division of labor. It's another thing that I don't see happening that often when I work with capital teams. So for those of you who don't know, you, you got to have at least two lawyers, right? And typically it's like, okay, I'm going to be the guilt guy and you're going to be the penalty person. And uh, I don't need to know. I don't need to hear like, do your thing. and Good luck. Good luck with that. Um, it's very common still, I think. Um, yeah. but that's not how you that's not how you roll. What why? No, so I think you know, most capital cases are about punishment. And so I think it is critical that we are thinking about um the outcome from start to finish. And and so the very first uh witness that takes the witness stand. The first police officer, he's a mitigation witness. So I don't want to approach him from the standpoint of what time did you arrive at the scene? What did you see at the scene? I want to think about how do I get part of my mitigation story from this witness? And so in order to do that, I have to be able to, I need to know all of the evidence in the first phase, all that police investigation, and I need to understand the client's story and how I can get that story into the very first witness. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's critical that we are all, and, and I struggle with this as I travel around the country working with teams to, as the mitigation specialist, give me all the police reports. And they'll say, well, why do you need that? Yeah. Well, I need that to understand, you know, how we're going to run the mitigation through the whole case. And frankly, there's mitigation in the investigation. Did he cooperate? How did he... How did he handle the police interrogation? You know, we got to mind all of that for mitigation. Mm -hmm. And in Rick's case in particular, we had um, the detective that had held himself out to be the hero because he had gotten Rick's confession was in fact Rick's control officer because Rick was on probation for possession of methamphetamine. And this officer had put him back into the streets as an informant, which is a huge no-no. And they fought us tooth and nail to, to discover that. Mm -hmm. And so when he took the witness stand, my first question to him was, Detective Deeds, I think was his name, are you a hero or a villain in this story. Wow. <laughs> what did he say? He did not know what to say. <laughs> but I was from that moment forward in control. Yeah. Um, because he had messed up. He should never have had Rick on the streets. He perpetuated that methamphetamine addiction. And, um, and our really aggressive work on... Um, building out that story, which was mitigation, and we told it in the first phase, was uh, critical. Amazing. And of course, he gets a life, he gets a life verdict, not death. Um, do you still have any contact? How's he doing? 
We do. He still he has had a heart issue, but he is um, he's doing as well as one can do. You know, he's yeah. been a good inmate, which is what we would have suspected. Um, yeah. And he's plugging along. OK, good. Um, so we're going to talk really quickly a little bit more about outside the box things, because there's a whole other article that we read. And I'm just going to kind of you hit the highlights, but I'm going to put that in the, the links, too, because when you're doing your team and, and I know this isn't necessary for Richard's case, but as you move forward through the years, you are constantly finding new ways to crack open our clients to help uncover their story and help them understand themselves and so that we can help the decision makers do the right thing and one of these things you you came across was called geo mapping what is it yeah so um i ha i started in 2016 working with a social geographer and i had never heard of social geography um and uh, met dr julie urbanic as a result of meeting her husband on an airplane um, and when he described what she did, it was so compatible with what we do that I um, immediately set up a meeting with her. And then when I further heard about this concept of body mapping, um, I had a case where I wanted my client's voice in the courtroom, but I didn't necessarily want him on the witness stand. And so this body mapping gave me that opportunity. So at a baseline, the social geographer is somebody that's looking at your client in relationship to his place in the world, his geography, his zip code. And so his, his community, his school, um, the poverty in that community. And so all of that is extraordinarily relevant to what we're investigating. The body map is a way to interact with the client and have the client tell a narrative about himself while using imagery that um, is built uh, as you're telling the story through what she calls totem. So if I have had an experience with my parents with, let's say, alcoholism, the client might, might uh, draw a picture of a, of a beer can. And later on, when we're going back and filming um, the client telling the story, he'll reference that beer can and then be reminded of the story about his father. Or if he's telling a story about how he stayed safe in prison, he might have, have built a force field around his body and then told about how it is that he keeps all the negative um, people out of his life while he's in prison because he's trying to stay focused on the positive and building himself up. And so that force field that he's drawn helps him to tell that story. And so what we have found is with the use of the body mapping that the clients have been extraordinarily articulate in telling their own stories in this format, where they're not under pressure, um, in a courtroom where it's so artificial and you're afraid of, you know, is the judge going to question me? Are people questioning me? Are they, am I embarrassing myself because I'm not as eloquent as the next guy? Um, in this format, um, clients from all education levels are really able to tell their stories. The way in which they decorate their body maps tells us a lot about um, everything from the neurological are they able to draw an image? Um, yes. Is that uh, it? I'm sharing yeah, for you guys who are watching this on YouTube or whatever. But I'll, again, this is in the, this is from the article that is written on this topic. And I but I just want to give a visual because there are two examples of body map, and I, I called it geo mapping, which is another thing that the body mapping evolves from geo because what it is is taking something that's um not necessarily visual medium uh it's more of a research-based situation of where they grow up and the geography of it but now we're into the world of art we're into yeah. the world of outside the box lawyering and, and drawing this picture so the it starts with an outline of a body and the client is starting to fill in all these uh amazing aspects of their lives with pictures yeah and then yeah. when Ju julie goes back and does the video she will 
use their voice and they're telling the story and then she'll bring up images of uh, from their lives and also maps of where they live. Sometimes um, some imagery from their actual communities where we might be driving through in a car. Um, so they're, they're, we've probably done, I don't know, 15 or 16 um, since we started this. And each one is just so unique. And um, and I'll tell you what, they've had an impact on prosecutors, on judges, um, and certainly on um, the people on our teams. Yeah, and, and I'm the video guy. I don't know if you know that, but that is sort of my bread and butter. So I'm so intrigued that this isn't just a picture. It's brought to life in, in, a, in the medium of video. So it's there's an audio recorded interview with the client while they're going through this body map and then that audio is used to to um, sort of narrate the the visual aspect, which is not just the visuals you're seeing here on the map, but also those amazing historical, rich historical visuals from their own life, old pictures, vi you know, vi videos, everything that we might include in a typical sentencing video. So this is just another super powerful way to use video to advocate for our clients. So I hope people are understanding, first of all, there's more than just sentencing mitigation videos, um, but that the sky's the limit when it comes to being creative and visual storytelling is always, almost always more powerful than than just the spoken word, in my opinion. Yeah, we played one of these. At, I agree. And I, you know, I in the we played one of these body maps out in California uh, last week, I think. And um, Judge Wood, who was um, the judge in the case, our client had had drawn these two boulders on his shoulders because of the weight of the case and what's happening. And at the end of the hearing, we were talking about the next court date. And the judge looks at Floyd and says, you know, now I know you have these big boulders on your shoulders. And I know that we're talking about, you know, continuing this to a little bit down the road. Lloyd, do you think that, you know, you can continue to withstand this pressure? <laughs> mm. Like, you know, that's when, you know, th you've done things right when she's referring to your video or his video. from mm -hmm. the so, Yep, absolutely. Yeah. And I love it because it's not it's a, at least your second story about a very compassionate judge. And yes. we, we like to sort of stereotype and create these caricatures of the of the evil maniacal judge who just wants to hurry your client into the death into the death death chamber but that's we know that's not true we know that every these are human beings and they want to do the right thing and once you give them that the truth of the story it shifts the whole it shifts the whole tone and tenor of uh and i'm thinking about okay i worked on the michigan one of the michigan militia cases one of the first clients and i was able to listen to the sentencing we did a video and i swear I swear it felt like a judge was talking to his own son during yeah. the sentencing hearing and they did a lot of really you know bad things there yeah. but it just shifts and and some lawyers go well do i send give this video to the judge beforehand or after you know usually a judge watches it before but sometimes it just takes the whole vibe in the courtroom and turns it upside down to where it's you're you're past the anger stage right yeah. you're into something else um, okay, so one other interesting thing, well, there's so many interesting things, but um, you talked about memory walks, that you employ something called memory walks in your cases. What is that? Well, so here's what we found is with witnesses who are close to the clients, um, and so I, I think one of the videos that I sent was a guy named Brian Shepard, and so Brian lived here in the Kansas City area and was was accused and convicted of one of the most notorious crimes here. It, it's kind of like JFK, that if you lived in Kansas City when this explosion happened, you knew exactly where you were. And so um, we did, we pulled off all the stops for this. And so his girlfriend at the time, uh, we put her in a car and we drove through all of the areas where they grew up where he proposed to her, where they camped out in um, an open field when their parents had kicked them both out of the house. And, 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 you know, a couple of things that we have found when we've taken people out into the community to do interviews is one, it loosens them up. They become very good storytellers when they're in their own environment, when they're not mm -hmm. in 
environment, when we're not sitting at the kitchen table with someone else blaring the damn TV in the other room, you know, but we're out in a place where they know the story. They know these streets. They know this community. And so as we're driving along, there's, there's this relaxed nature to it. They're the tour guide. They're the host. And so, again, what we're getting is two things. You're seeing the real community, the real houses, you know, the little tiny square box that this family lived in. And she's driving up to it and she's saying, you know, I'm looking at a hovel. I'm looking at poverty. And she's looking at, you know, when you walk through these doors, you know, out here, it was like black and white. But you walk through the doors of the shepherd's home and it was technicolor. Everybody just loved everybody. Everybody fought hard and they loved hard. And, you know, and it was just that kind of passion, the way she could tell that story, because she was looking at the house. We would not have gotten that sitting in the office. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is the court is now, you know, the, the, in that particular case, the judge was from Kansas City, but I guarantee had not been in that community. <laughs> mm -hmm. Or if they had, they drove through fast. Um, mm -hmm. So it gives, it reminds the court that my client comes from a zip code that has more violence at, at different points in time than in Iraq. Wow. So this is what it looks like. You know, this is the trash piled up on the, this, these are the boarded up houses. These are the closed schools. Now we're driving by them as mom is talking about the experience with her child. And so that's what a memory walk is. Love it. Love it. Well, we could keep going, but um, we're going to stop here. I want to say, first of all, I hope this is the first of many conversations that we have together because we have so much to learn from you. You're incredible. I want to give a shout out to Victoria Rusk because she's she's been on the podcast and she's an amazing mitigation specialist, an incredible human. And she's the one that said, you got to talk to Cindy Short. And Victoria described you as a brilliant lawyer, a fearless advocate, a top notch mitigation expert and storyteller. And she was not wrong. So that is um all, all all thanks go to victoria um you are all of those things and i also wanted to say that one of the other things that connected me to your your writing was you repeatedly invoked an amazing article by alex kotlowitz, kotlowitz um in the face of death which i've read many times and i think it's extraordinary it's, it was in new york times i think in the sunday magazine so i'm going to put a link to that article in there but um it's, you know, the takeaway, which you know all too well, is that our job is to convince the decision makers that, that our client is a life worth saving. Yeah. You're yeah. really good at that. So I just wanted to say thank you. And thanks thank for you. spending some time with us on Set for Sentencing. And I hope we talk soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. I hope we do too. That's it for today, but before we go, I just wanted to take a moment and say thank you. To you, the listener, for spending time with us today getting set for sentencing. Whether you're a lawyer, someone who could use the help, or maybe you're just a true crime buff who loves the inside scoop on how this whole thing works, I am so glad you're here, and I hope you keep listening. If you're interested in knowing more about what I do, mitigation videos, case consults, live teaching, on-demand educational content, books, articles, all of it, please visit www.dougpassonlaw.com. I'm Doug Passon. Until next time, hang in there. Wait a minute, that's a stupid way to sign off on a podcast about sentencing. Hang in there. What, what's the matter with you, man? I guess they call that gallows humor. Sorry. All right. Well, I will see you next time on Set for Sentencing. Bye-bye.